H2 norm of U0 times a, a factor like this. There are two terms. The first term has a factor epsilon, but here is uh, uh, the gradient of psi integrate uh, in the whole omega. Uh, second factor has a, a square root of epsilon, epsilon small, so this actually is is, is worse, but you integrate actually in the neighborhood of the boundary here. So that is, that is uh, uh, this lemma here. We'll see that uh, uh, the second theorem follows uh, easily from, from this lemma, uh, once you have this lemma down there. All right, so how do you do it uh, to see the second theorem? You simply take your test function to be W epsilon. That will be a, a function in H10 of omega. Okay, so you, you take uh, psi to be W epsilon, and you use the ellipticity uh, to bound this from below by uh, the, the L2 norm of the gradient of uh, W epsilon uh, L2 norm squared here, okay? And then you simply replace, you'll see the, I mean this, you can actually replace the second term by the first. Well, first, bound these two terms by square root of epsilon times L2 norm of gradient per side. And so that will give you this estimate. You can do better uh, than this, uh, and now that's down in the lecture notes. Uh, so this is a very rough uh, uh, use of this estimate. So, uh, but there are other things you can do which actually produce a, a better estimate. So, but I would just want to get some, uh, the idea across using a simple case here. So now let's see how do we prove this lemma, okay? So there are some calculations. Uh, I'm going to have to. Sh I'm going to show you on the board. Well, actually, I don't think I have time, but it's uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You you take the double epsilon, uh, and uh, you take the gradient of there are three terms in double epsilon. You take the gradient of each term. And uh, this is the first term, second term, and the third term is a product. So the gradient by product rule will generate two terms. And uh, the last term, because the derivative goes to the second factor, your epsilon is still there. But you lost your epsilon on the first term because when you take the derivative of uh, chi of x over epsilon, you're going to have an epsilon in the denominator which cancel it out. Okay, so the last term will be, it's, it's a good term. You already have your epsilon in place. Uh, so, so for the rest, we're going to have to deal with how do we deal with the second term, <coughs> the first three terms here. So we'll write, we're going to simply put this term a hat, the gradient of u0 up there, okay? And then we'll be replacing the gradient of u0 by the cutoff function multiplied to the smoothing of the gradient of u0. So you generate a difference, you generate a difference here, and when you combine all the remaining terms, you end up with a b. b of x over epsilon, the b is the uh, function, the matrix we introduced <laughs> earlier which has these two properties. One is that the mean is zero, another is the divergence of each column is zero. Okay? Okay, so now let's simply multiply the, uh, the gradient of a test function to the both sides and integrating on omega. So it's a f and so, and then we use the factor that both u epsilon and u zero are solutions of the Dirichlet problem. So this gives you, uh, so these two integrals are the same because the right-hand side, the fourth term, f is the same. 
uh, for both boundary, both the declared problem. So this equal to zero. I mean, this is are the same. So you end up with uh, these three terms here. Okay. So I want to claim that this is first two terms, you're going to have your epsilon in place, or maybe square root of epsilon. Well, how do we know that? Well, look at the first term here. Remember, eta epsilon is supported uh, in omega but vanish near the boundary. So, uh, so in the interior, I mean, away from the boundary by, say, four times epsilon, one minus eta epsilon is zero. So this term, this integral only taking place in the boundary layer of, of, of omega. And with a boundary layer, if you use a boundary layer estimate, you can increase the derivative. You're going to generate an epsilon in place. But the price you pay is that you're going to have to go to the second derivative of u0. So that's fine. For this term here, it's <coughs> Here you have a smoothing, here you have a function, and because of the second lemma, the difference between a function and smoothing can be estimated. With uh, epsilon, and again, the price you pay, you have to go to a derivative of the gradient of the U, but that we can afford with that. There's a second derivative. And the last term already has an epsilon in place. So the problem is how do you deal with this, second, this uh, third term, which you don't see any epsilon here. How do we know it, you, you're going to have epsilon come up or square root of epsilon come up? <laughs> okay, so this come up with the property uh, that we're going to have for the corrector. So, so that uh, so this here here is the place we we use uh, we use the uh, the skew symmetry the symmetry of the flux corrector. So the calculation goes like this. So you have bij of x over epsilon, s epsilon, du, du zero, dxj, and uh, d psi dxi times eta epsilon. Okay, so we're going to write this as epsilon, take derivative of of the flux corrector, kij of x over epsilon, then s epsilon, du zero dx g, g and d psi dx i times the cutoff. Okay, so that's how that's one of the properties of the flux corrector here. We're taking the derivative of k is summed. When you take a derivative, there will be a epsilon on the denominator, so we need the epsilon here to cancel it out there. Okay, so the next thing you do is that you're going to use the product rule. You want to throw this guy here into the derivative. P i k, k i j of x over epsilon and d phi d x i s d u zero d x j and then you have Okay, of course this is not correct uh, because you have to product row. We have to generate a another term which is in a form of epsilon phi k i j of x over epsilon d square psi derivative falls here d x k d x i d u zero d x j and eta epsilon and because of skew. Symmetry, if I interchange i and j, it's the same thing. But this guy has a minus sign come up. So this last term actually is zero. So that's the calculation showing on the screen there. Okay? So, so, you, so, you, so, you, so you see how this uh, factor epsilon come up. Yes? I don't have an epsilon. No, third term. Third term. Oh, fourth. Four. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the gradient affects the eta epsilon. Yes. Isn't that you, you have one yeah, one? very good point. They, so if you take a derivative of a gradient, you're going to have an epsilon in a denominator, but the gradient of the uh, eta epsilon support near the boundary. Oh, okay. 
So that will uh, uh, give you back square rule of Ipsilon. Very good point. Thank you. Yeah. So that's all you need uh, to, to finish the proof. So you see how this uh, flux corrector is used. In the process, we use the uh, definition of the effective matrix and the corrector. Of course, you, 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 you know you're going to use it somewhere. Uh, for otherwise, you can just replace the effective matrix by uh, some other matrix. It cannot be true. OK? <laughs> All right, so, uh, so that's, that's the proof of theorem two, the convergence rate in H1. And now let's come, come, uh, come back to the, 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 the first theorem, which we want to show that uh, the convergence uh, in L2 with a power epsilon here. So first order convergence here. So the way to do this is through a duality argument. So we, we're going to solve a uh, Dedekind problem with a zero boundary data, but, but in the right hand side we choose a arbitrary function in C zero infinity of omega. Okay, and then we introduce the sort of uh, uh, analog of a double epsilon for this problem. So it's a v epsilon minus v zero, which is the homogenized problem, minus this uh, uh, epsilon times the corrector for L epsilon star, and the same kind of stuff. But we do this for the operator L epsilon star, the adjoint of uh, L epsilon. Okay, so the chi star is the correctors for, for A star, for the adjoint of A. There. Okay, so let's test this. Uh, uh, W epsilon without the derivative against this uh, function g, which is arbitrary. So we replace this g by by the divergence of this. So you, by definition, you, you have this one. You write out uh, v epsilon. You uh, you're going to have three terms come up, and uh, and uh, we're going to have to e estimate each term one, two, and three. Okay, again, the goal is to generate a power epsilon. We do not like square root. We want to do better in, in L2. We already have a square root in H1. Okay, so the first term is it's of this form. So you have uh, an integral of A times the grain of W epsilon times uh, the grain of R epsilon. Both of these generate square root of epsilon. So putting together, you have a power one in place. So that's the first term is, is, is fine. Okay, uh, here I will need some uh, smoothness condition uh, for omega because I need to, I need to have a, a H2 estimate for L0 star for this last step. And that require, say for instance, C11 will be, will be, will be suffice. Okay, so the, the second term, you, you have this uh, integral of A, gradient of W epsilon times the gradient of V epsilon. Here, we're going to simply use the main lemma. And you treat V0 as a test function. Okay, so V0 is in H10, so we can take as a test function. You generate two terms. The first term gave you power epsilon, the second term, you have a square root of epsilon, but it's integrated on a boundary layer. If you in increase the derivative to two, then you have another epsilon from a boundary layer estimate. So go get back to power one again. Okay. So uh, finally, the third term is so again we use the main lemma, and uh, you're going to have to estimate. You treat this as a test function the whole thing as a test function. You have to estimate L2 norm, L2 norm on the boundary, and it tends, tends out, it works out just per perfectly fine. Okay, so putting this together, we, uh, we have this estimate for any function G in C0 infinity of omega. So by duality, you have L2 norm of W epsilon, it's bounded by epsilon times the L2 norm of U0. And so that's, the W epsilon, there's a third term, but third term actually is already in good term. And so just throw it to the right hand side, that's, that's what we have.
All right? So that's, that's a proof of theorem two. In the lecture notes, there uh, there are more elaborate uh, estimate uh, involve non-tangential maximum function uh, on the Lipschitz domain with symmetry conditions. Uh, so I don't want to show you that it takes too much time. Uh, you can read them, uh, but you already seen the main idea I have uh, for the for this uh, uh, simple setting. Okay. Okay. So actually, it's. Uh, I uh, have a theorem here. Suppose you actually have a symmetry condition. Again, I do not know, I do not need uh, smoothness, bound measurable will be fine. You can actually do better than, you can actually generate a PQ. Well, P and Q are related by this uh, equation. Uh, this, is, this is interesting because this, is, this relation is the right scale. It's a right scale uh, because you can scale both sides and the constant will remain in, uh, invariant. Okay, and uh, and also for H1, you can actually get a more precise estimate in the right hand side. Instead of uh, U0 H1, H2 norm, you can get a H1, uh, 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 H1 norm of the boundary data plus some LQ norm of the right hand side. Okay. So I want to spend the last uh, 10 minutes, uh, maybe five, uh, talk about uh, one applications of, uh, of this uh, second, second estimate uh, in the context of a boundary value problem and a radic estimate. Uh, well, well, some of you knows really, really well here. So, uh, so before I get to that, I just me briefly mention that uh, uh, the same argument can carry over for Neumann, and that's one of the good things of using cutoff. The boundary data actually does not enter into the play. So we do a, a cutoff on the other boundary. You can do the same uh, uh, proof uh, for Dirichlet and the and Neumann uh, boundary data here. So you you have the same estimate. Okay, so going back to this, uh, uh, I want to mention uh, this this H one estimate. I want to mention a uh, how this will relate to some kind of radic estimate. I call this large radic estimate in homogenization. So, so if I write this, uh, one of the estimates, the first one there, so that is what, the, what, what, we, what we're claiming is that suppose you have a solution uh, to a Dirichlet problem with a right-hand size zero, boundary data f, okay? The second, the first line, it, so what we claim here is that if you integrate the gradient near the boundary layer, so this is a less or equal to uh, epsilon or constant times epsilon, and this is bounded by a constant times epsilon times the, uh, the tangential derivative of the boundary data uh, f, okay? So, uh, so that's that's the first first equation. The second the second inequality relates to the boundary, uh, to 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 the Neumann problem here. Okay. So why do we call this large scale radic estimate? Uh, by the way, again here, you this is true for Lipschitz domain. Uh, a is elliptic, periodic, and symmetric but we do not need any smoothness condition on the coefficient, just bounded measurable. We'll give you this one here. So why this is re uh, relate to the radic estimate? Uh, so I want to bring up the, the small scale radic estimate. So, so, so let's say you have domain omega, you, you pick up a point on the boundary, so this is a local radic estimate. And we claim that if you integrate 
uh, on the, this piece of boundary, say with uh, the radius of epsilon, say this point is P here, the gradient, U epsilon is a solution. D sigma, it is bounded by a constant on a bigger ball, so the gradient of F plus, plus a constant over epsilon times a volume integral in a ball centered at the P of radius two epsilon intersect omega. Okay, so here I'm assuming L, L epsilon of U epsilon equal to zero. So this is true if we're assuming A is Hilder, continuous, and elliptic. And I do not need periodicity. This is a small scale estimate uh, because, because you can scale, it suffice to prove this for epsilon equal to one. And then scale to, and blow up to scale epsilon, and this is true. So, so we do not need periodicity. Okay? And then if you, if, you, if you cover the boundary by balls of radius epsilon with a finite overlap, you can deduce that the u epsilon squared d sigma is bounded by a constant square d sigma plus a constant over epsilon times, say, the distance of x to the boundary, the boundary layer, some constant times epsilon d u epsilon squared. This is a volume integral. These are the surface integrals, okay? So this is, a, this is again, it's a small scale estimate. And we do not need periodicity, okay? And as you can see, the large scale here, if I combine this two scale estimate, small scale and a large scale estimate, this estimate allow you to control this volume term by the first term. So we have completely separate two scales. In a small scale case, we only need the operator to be elliptic and the Hilda continues. In the large scale case, we only need the operator to be elliptic and periodic. But if you all have all three, you can combine them <coughs> to generate a full scale uh, radic uh, estimate. Uh, so this actually was proved by uh, Kennegan and myself back in uh, 2011 using a uh, integral by parts. So here we, we there's a, present a different proof here. Uh, so you got a full scale that uh, the boundary, the, the full gradient is controlled by the tangential and also by the core normal derivative with a constant independent of, of epsilon. And the coefficient assumed to be Elliptic, periodic, symmetric, and also Hilder continues. Omega is Lipschitz. Okay, so with this, you can solve the L2 boundary value problem using the method of layer potential. And this is also done in the same paper, uh, but because once you have the radical identity, then you, then you can prove the, using layer potential to, to show the, the estimate uh, for the non-tangential maximum function. Okay. So, so going back, how, how this, this is done? Well, it's, uh, it's a, f a simple consequence of this, what we have for, for, for the uh, estimate in H1, this line of estimate here, square root of epsilon times the H1 norm on the boundary. And now if I just look at what happened near the boundary, in the boundary layer, the third term because of the cutoff drops out. So you simply have the derivative of u epsilon minus the derivative of u zero, and so you have, uh, uh, so this term here 
controlled by the derivative of u0 in the boundary layer, then because u0 solve a constant coefficient, and we do have non-tangential maximum function estimate. So the, the, esti the integral, the volume integral in the, in the boundary layer can be controlled by the boundary data. You, because the, the, the boundary layer has a thickness uh, epsilon, this generate this square rule of epsilon, which just match the second term. Okay, and that's all I want to say. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? No. Yes. Uh, yes, one of my uh, former student, uh, Chang Xu, has, uh, has written several papers uh, on the subject. So his most recent paper actually deal with uh, layer potentials for operators with uh, with low order terms, yeah. It's, uh, you, can, you, can, you probably can find uh, on the archive, his, uh, his last name is Xu, first name spelled as Q-I-A-N-G, okay. So, they, they can, so he can deal with the first, first order and, and zero order, uh, operate with first order and zero order terms. All right, thank you.